replay. Consistency is the key to marketing with Tyson Mutrix, episode 259. Are you ready to make your law firm a profit generating machine that will free up your time and skyrocket your impact? With more than two decades of business growth experience and having proven that you can be successful while prioritizing your family and your impact, introducing the Profit with Law podcast. I am your host, the creator of the firm differentiator 10x effect, Moshe Amsel. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Profit with Law. Today, we have a special guest, and uh, you're going to really appreciate this episode. First of all, I apologize for my voice in this intro, battling either allergies or a cold, so please forgive me. But the upcoming interview, the audio is great. I don't have a cold there. And I had the pleasure of having a conversation with Tyson Mutrix. Now, Tyson Mutrix is the managing partner of Mutrix Firm LLC in St. Louis and Columbia, Missouri. He is a personal injury lawyer, and he is also the host of the Maximum Lawyer podcast. Tyson got his law degree in St. Louis University and is passionate about motorcycles, bourbon, and his family. What excites me about this upcoming interview is, first of all, we we talk about some marketing things that um, every attorney who is trying to build a law firm should listen really closely to. There's some really, really key nuggets that Tyson shares with us, and um, you really will get a lot of value from it. But then we go off script and we talk about his uh, how he got involved with the podcast, um, his Maximum Lawyer podcast. He also talks about his upcoming event that he's hosting together with his podcast co-host, and it sounds like an exciting thing. So I urge you to take a listen and let me know what you think. And if uh, if you enjoy it, go ahead and share this episode with your friends, share it out on social media, spread the wealth, and let other people get a chance to hear it as well. So without further ado, here is the replay of that interview that I've had with Tyson. My name is Moshe Amsel. I'm your host of Profit With Law, and I'm here today with Tyson Mutrix of Mutrix Law. Tyson, how are you? I am good, Moshe. How are you doing? Doing wonderful today. I appreciate you joining me here on the show. You're not only a law firm owner of Mutrix Law, but you also run another podcast, and that's the uh, Maximum Lawyer podcast with Jim Hacking. Is that correct? That's correct. So I do want to ask you some questions about running your law firm and things that that our audience would want to hear uh, on your journey to success. But I also am going to want to ask you some questions about your podcast and and being a podcast host. So we'll kind of cover both of those in in this interview, and I hope that uh, that that's okay. Absolutely, fire away. I'm 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 ready to answer anything. All right. So I've actually been a listener of your show as well, and um, I know that your your show started in 2016, and back then you were an attorney for six years. So if my math is correct, you've been in in the game for somewhere between eight and nine years at this point. Uh, nine years, right? Right at the nine year mark. So yeah, right, right around there. Awesome. So how far into your legal career was it before you started your own firm? Just under a year, I'd say. Um, yeah, just under a year, I'd worked for a, a large volume firm um, in St. Louis. And then after that, I moved on to start my own firm. So it's been a while. We There was a merger with another firm in there that, that, that has since split up. But of those nine years, roughly around eight years, we've uh, I've had my own firm. That's great. So when you started your firm, it was just you or did you actually start with staff to begin with when you started? No, it was just me. That lasted about six months. So it was just me. Um, it was me answering the phones, me requesting the medical records, uh, me sending letters out and emails out to clients, uh, me requesting police reports, uh, doing my bookkeeping. It was just me pretty much, which is, I think, a pretty standard story 
uh, when it comes to solo and small firms. They usually start with just one person, but yeah, just me. Yeah, absolutely. And I would agree with you that most uh, most attorneys start that way. The question is, is when do you decide to bring on that first employee? And some people struggle with that their entire career and never hire that first person. You lasted six months and then brought somebody on. So how did you know when it was time to uh, make that first hire, bring that first person into into the firm? Well, step one is make sure you have enough money. But it's what's interesting is, is that I mean, you don't, most people don't think of, of actually hiring people as an investment that will make you more money. Uh, we just look at it as an expense. And so it took me, I probably should have hired someone right away. I really should have, because I just wasn't getting anything done. Because whenever you're answering the phones and doing everything else, not a lot of work actually gets done if you think about it. Like, you know, what I mean by that is moving cases forward, nothing's really getting done because you're answering the phones and doing everything else, administering the firm. Um, you're not really doing anything else. Once I finally had gotten over that, okay, and it was actually after a meeting I had, Jim Manning, he's, a, he's actually a, a real, he owns a real estate company in St. Louis. And he was like, you know, you, you gotta remember, like when you're paying these salaries, you're not paying them all up front, you know, you're paying them each month. It's, it's, it's it, they're bite-sized pieces that you're paying. And so I, I finally, you know, warmed up to that idea. And said, yeah, you know, it's starting to hire someone, it's, it's not too bad. And you know, you, you break it down, you're not paying these big chunks of money. You're not, so you're not paying a, you know, $30,000 salary or $40,000 salary, 50, whatever it may be, you're breaking it up, you know? And so uh, I finally got over that and that changed a lot for me. I got, I was able to get a lot more done and I've since learned about a lot about hiring, firing and things like that. But uh, you have to sort of get over that fear that you're not going to have any more money. I mean, the worst case scenario is you're going to fire the person, but you know what? That's just because either you're not doing you're not doing the right things or or they're not doing the right things. In a in a in a ideal world, you hire someone that's going to bring in more money for you. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I've learned um, in the process of growing, being a business, growing a business, uh, being a business owner is that. You, you need to understand that it, this is the chicken and the egg question. Like, which comes first? Do you first get the business that you can't handle and now you're forced to bring somebody on to handle it? Or do you bring somebody on and that creates the capacity for you to bring on more clients? And it's definitely the latter. It's definitely if you create the situation where there's a need for those clients, those clients will fill the gap. It's almost like osmosis where, you know, it, it's going to go to the highest pressure um, area and those clients are going to, are going to somehow get sucked into that vacuum that you create by creating that bandwidth. So now you said something interesting that you really should have hired somebody right away. And you had started off saying that what you did was pretty much standard. So if somebody is first starting a practice and really the, um, this podcast is not, it's not intended to be something for somebody who's just starting out, but it's a great question to ask because there's going to be people who are listening to this that don't have their own firm and are thinking about starting one. If you don't have clients coming in, we both agree that you should have that help. You know, how, how should somebody who's starting a firm approach this? Is this something that they should have come in with an investment or savings prepared to do that? Or do they get their first client and then take that money the first client's bringing in and hire that, you know, make that hire? What would you advise somebody who's just starting? So I'm going to, I'm going to back up a second because this is a really good question, especially for lawyers. Uh, I get this question all the time, you know, should you start your own firm right out of law school? My, my answer is always no. Okay, so my starting point is you shouldn't start this with basically no clients. What you should do is you should work, and this is just my own opinion, people disagree with me, but I, I, the, the reason why I think that this is true is you don't know jack squat coming out of law school. Yeah, I mean, you, you've read a bunch of books and stuff. You don't know how to practice law. You know how to read really well. That's pretty much what you, what you know how to do. And so my opinion is you should work for someone, and I was in a very fortunate position where I worked for a firm that trained me really freaking well. I mean, even prior to graduating from law school, I'd worked for them for three years and they trained me really, really well. And I was doing everything that the lawyers were doing by the time I graduated. So I really knew uh, what I was doing because the training was incredible. So if you do this in the way I think you should do it, you should work for someone. And by that, by a year or two, you should have a pretty good client base and you should be able to take those clients with you. Um, because you've, you've stayed in, in touch with them. You've taken really good job, uh, really good care of them. Um, they're happy with your services. And in Missouri, you, you can take your clients with you. It, it's, they get the, the choice of who they hire. So, um, and you may have to pay the other firm some money, whatever, that's fine. But 
whenever you start, you should have a, a good steady flow of clients. And honestly, if you don't, you probably shouldn't start your firm because you probably, don't, you probably haven't learned the techniques and, and the marketing techniques in getting those clients, getting people attracted to you. So I guess I, I mean, hopefully I didn't lose the question there, but if you can, if you, if you, when you leave your other firm, if you take my advice, you work for someone else, you've got those clients with you. I wouldn't reckon, necessarily recommend taking staff that works for that firm, but start hiring it right away and get people in your firm right away so they can keep that, that customer service that you're used to. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. If you're able to bring clients with you, then you kind of sort of have some of cash flow coming in that can support hiring somebody. So that makes sense. Um, I know that there are some areas of law where it's a one and done kind of situation. So bringing clients with you might not really be, uh, be helpful, but I guess you could tap into that same client base for referrals and, you know, and, and build up clients pretty quickly that way as well. And I, and I just realized I got off base a little bit because I get, went off my tangent about law school. I'll back up and answer your question. Um, so whenever you're working for someone else or if hopefully you've got some sort of bankroll to finance your firm because with personal injury especially, because I do, I do just personal injury and nothing else. If you're doing criminal defense, family law, um, other things where you're paying, getting cash up front, you can technically you know, start with very little money. But with, the thing with, with injury lawyers is we spend a lot of money for six to nine months whenever you have a very a brand new firm. And so our bottom line goes straight. It's, it's just, uh, it, or we have no money coming in. It's just going straight down. And so we don't start to see those returns for six to nine months. And then we get into the black. We're in red for six to nine months. And trust me, I've, I've been through this a couple of times now. I started my own firm. I saw it was. I partnered with another firm and we basically treated our firms as separate firms. And as we started to meld together and for nine months, we weren't making any money. We're way in the red and it's just how it works. I mean, it's just how it works with personal injury stuff. So uh, especially with personal injury lawyers, you need a bankroll. You, you need some sort of bankroll and that's, if that's a line of credit, that's just a bunch of money in the, in the account, whatever it may be, you need some sort of access to cash to pay employees because otherwise you're just, you're going to go under really quick. Um, there are resources with injury lawyers like Advocate Capital, which will allow you to front case expenses. You can do things like that. It's going to cost your clients a premium, but there, you, there's resources out there for you. Oh, so many, so many things you've mentioned that we could take this conversation in so many different directions. Um, but I like that you're focusing on some cash flow issues because so many people who go into the business of law and, and start approaching starting their practice are completely unaware, I think is the right terminology of what it takes to run a business. And they, they don't um, understand how to forecast what that cash flow need is going to be. And that's so important. So kind of like having a business plan in place where you can map out what your expenses are going to be and how long realistically is it going to take for that money to start coming in so that you can see what kind of uh, war chest you need is really important. The other thing is, is that once you get that war chest, there's such a temptation to spend it on the wrong things. Yep. And uh, you really need to, if you had that written plan to begin with, now you've got the guide that you're going to follow and say, okay, no, this money is for this purpose and I'm not going to use it on anything else. Whereas if you go into it blindly saying, okay, I need $100,000 to start my firm. Well, by the time you finish renting an office space and leasing an office space and, and putting furniture in it and buying office equipment and maybe hiring staff or whatever, you know, paying for a bunch of software, there's a ton of things you could spend money on. And before you turn around, that $100,000 is gone. On and now you don't have that that runway that you need. I like to switch gears here for a second and get away from this how to start a firm because that's not where I want to focus our conversation. Sure. What I would like to do is go back to something that you said earlier, which is you shouldn't start a firm if you don't know how to get clients. And that leads us right into the marketing conversation, which I think is should be the front and center point of running a law firm is you got to know how to bring in those clients. If you can't bring in the clients consistently, then you've got constant cash flow issues and it's very hard to hire staff because you can't, you, you don't know that you're going to be able to pay them. So you're very reluctant to do that. You also want to make sure that you're able to survive and you're always worrying about, okay, am I going to pay my employees or am I going to pay myself? So being able to bring in clients consistently is really key to being able to run a successful practice without needing to worry every day. Where's, where's my cash coming from? 
So you've been doing this for a while. You have a firm now that's, uh, I believe, 12 people in your firm right now. So right. Um, anybody who's trying to get to, you know, from solo to the million dollar mark of revenue uh, would be able to take advice from you because you've been there. So what are the marketing strategies that somebody should follow from when they're solo to they, the, now they're starting to bring on staff and they maybe need to go scale beyond what worked originally? So the, it's funny. So the, one of the first questions I ask whenever I speak to law students, I say, what's the most important thing about running a law firm? And they're like, oh, you know, being a really good lawyer and doing this or knowing discovery, blah, 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 knowing the rules. Yeah, those are all important. But the number one thing is, is getting clients because if you don't have clients, you can't do any work on them. You can't do, you actually can't work on the files. You can't help them out. So you need to learn to get those in. This question, we could talk about a billion different ways of getting clients. Uh, I think the key is just consistency uh, in, in whatever way you choose. For me, it's referrals. I get a lot of referrals from other lawyers. I planted that seed really early in my career when I worked for that volume injury firm. I was, you know, any cases that we didn't take, I was sending out to to other lawyers. And so that they were, they have always remembered that and they've taken care of me. And so I, and I always make sure I, I stay in touch with those people and stay, stay in touch with my referral partners that take care of my referral partners. That's just one component of what, what, the way we do things. We also make sure that our name's out there. We do a bunch of videos and we stay in touch on, on so, in social media. So basically our, our channels are YouTube video, Facebook, and referrals or referral partners, other attorneys. Um, that's basically our three channels. That's what we work on. And we work on those pretty hard. But you can do it for a variety of different ways. We don't work really, really hard on SEO. We work a little, it's kind of hard on SEO. Uh, we've got a ton of reviews on Google My Business. And so we get a lot of cases through that. Um, so that's another channel. But honestly, we don't, it's not like we focus on that as a channel. It's, we do get cases from it. But it, the key is to be consistent, whether whatever channel you are, and experiment a lot. I've failed a lot with marketing, different marketing channels. And, and I knew it was, it's just an experiment. I've tried different marketing companies. I've paid for leads, which I think is garbage for the most part. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. Just make sure you're consistent with how you're doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, but I would like to latch into, before we move on from the marketing conversation, I would like to latch into the three things that you are having success with, because I think the people who can use those channels uh, might be able to, to gain something from some of your experience that you've achieved. So first of all, with referrals, which is um, what you're describing is the bulk of your business is coming that way. What would you give as advice to somebody who says, how do I go about getting referral partners? And I, my understanding is, is your referral partners are other attorneys. So how do I go about to going to other attorneys that perhaps might view themselves as my competition and partner up with them and, and, you know, and have a situation where, first of all, what do I send to them? And then, you know, how do they know what to send to me? So there's attorneys that I've never sent a single case and they still send me cases. Um, and so a big part of it is that they know, they trust me because there's a lot of personal injury lawyers out there that will screw them over and not pay them the, the co-counsel fee. So in Missouri, we can, we can pay co-counsel fees. And so they'll bring in cases and sometimes they'll help, help with certain parts of the case. They'll take care of intake or they'll take care of, you know, the client facing stuff. There's a variety, variety of agreements that we have. The main thing is trust with those attorneys because they know I'm not going to screw them out of their co-counsel fee at the end of the case because we're pretty much in complete control of that money at the end of the case. That's a big part of it. But it's really about, I mean, it's, just, it's such a deep conversation because it's really about nurturing relationships is what it's really about. There's no real key trick to this, right? There's, you meet with these people, you have you build relationships with these people. People listen to this, maybe like, oh yeah, whatever. It's, it's that simple, okay? It's, it's, you know, that old adage, you know, get people to know, like, and trust you. That's what it's about. You know, you meet with them on a regular basis. You take care of them. You make sure that they can trust you. And you treat them like a human being. You do those basic things and guess what they're going to do? They know what you, what, you, what you do as a business. They're going to refer you to people. Um, and so just do those basic things. And it's pretty freaking simple in my opinion. Right. Tyson, I love that you say that because so much about um, being successful in business is 
how you treat people and where you come from. So if you're always coming from a place of service and how can I serve you, uh, people love that. And that works for your clients. It works for your employees and it works for your referral partners. It work, basically works all the way around. So, you know, I love that you that you bring that up and that's that should be the core focus. Do you use any sort of um, system to make sure that you're on top of these referral partners and that you don't let one go for too long before you, get, you go out to lunch or something like that? Yeah, so I use Infusionsoft and it's really kind of funny. Um, and if you, there's a variety of different CRMs out there that you can use. You can use whatever you want. Uh, I like Infusionsoft. I think it's really good. There's a lot of automation elements to it. But this is for a non-lawyer that I was, uh, I would go and get my hair cut every few weeks, you know, and I would always, I had this little game I would play with myself he didn't know it was a game, but I would go in, the guy would cut my hair, and I would get up, get one little addition, additional tidbit uh, about him and his family or what he does. And each time I would come in the next time, I would mention what we talked about the previous experience. And so wh whatever you use, if it's a spreadsheet or something else, take notes on people because it makes such a difference whenever you're talking to these people when you remember that their son has been playing the guitar and they're they're struggling with certain things or they they played a, a, a song recently that was a new song for them and they really did, did did a good job and you mention that the next time you see them they will remember you forever so i don't expect you to know to remember everything that uh, every discussion you've had with every single person that's why you have a crm to track it and keep notes on people it is, it's really freaking simple. You know, write down people's anniversaries, write down their, their spouse's name. Um, if, if I ever go into a meeting with a referral partner, I'll go to my phone and I'll start looking, what, do, what, do I, what notes do I have on them? Hey, you know, how, how's Samantha doing? You know, how's such and such doing? Ask about their, their spouse, you know, and it makes all the difference. It's incredible. And I know whenever people have done their homework on me, because they're doing the same stuff. I mean, they're, they're, they're asking the same things. It makes a big difference. Absolutely. Uh, so real quick, for those of you who are listening and are like tr struggling to, you know, manage paycheck to paycheck, don't go looking for a CRM right now. Take out a spreadsheet and start can't taking notes that way. You could get fancy with it later. But uh, this is this is such gold. And I hope that you're taking notes. Notebook. Uh, you can give a notebook. I mean, it's 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 simple. It's really simple. There you go. So Tyson, for those of you who are listening on the audio version, Tyson pulled out a notebook from his pocket and held it up in the air for us to see on video. Um, but I love that you are systematic about it because really that's the key to success in business is getting into the habit of doing things systematically. And whether it's referral partners or client meetings or the way you produce the deliverable of your your work that you do in your practice, uh, the key is to do the same thing every single time. And uh, having, a, having a system for that, in this case, Tyson's got a CRM he uses, but whatever your system is, if it's a notebook, just have a way that you can easily find it and make sure that you take notes and you can go back and look at that. Um, so I love that you that you said that. Now, you also mentioned that you do video on YouTube and you do uh, stuff on Facebook. When did you add that into your repertoire of marketing? At what size was your firm that you started to focus on something beyond referrals? And, you know, so how far did referrals carry you in your growth journey? I mean, they've always been an integral part, but I would say, so I will say this to whenever I first started my firm, I'm going to back up a second. I also also started taking on some criminal cases too because of that issue I was talking about with cash flow. Criminal cases, you can get cash up front. Injury cases, you get paid on the back end. So I got into SEO really early on with criminal cases because I thought it was like shooting fish in a barrel back. This was you know, nine, 10 years ago, or roughly nine years ago. I recognized it in law school and actually launched a website and started to get ready for that um, started putting on content without giving legal advice. I started putting on content um, to sort of also age my website a little bit because I knew I wanted to, it was just TysonMutrix.com. I just wanted to age that website a little bit. So I did some of the basics. But whenever I first launched, I hit SEO pretty hard on the criminal side, not on the injury side because I just, I knew it was pointless. I mean, people are spending, you know, five grand a month on injury stuff. So it's, it's hard to break into that market. And I, I completely understand that. And I acknowledge it then. But back then, Getting, getting, getting SEO leads was super easy for criminal cases. Um, the next step after that was pay-per-click. I did pay-per-click and it was super freaking easy to get those cases. 
And so I, to, I guess to answer your question, from a criminal, from the criminal uh, standpoint, very early on, from the injury standpoint, uh, I'd say I started doing video. It's probably been five years ago or so. Or so. so we probably ran a, right around a four-person firm. Um, so right around that point, and I always talk about the difference between pre-video and post-video. In the courthouse, it was always a pre-video. Hey, what's going on, buddy? How you doing? They couldn't remember my name. Post-video, everyone knew my name because they knew I was doing the videos. I was putting out a video every single day, and this was this was before video became big. There was no, there was no, there wasn't that video button on your Facebook app. There was it was all very very early in the game. So it was. I hate the phrase game changer. So it wasn't a game changer, but it did definitely elevate my game. Very cool. Um, so for your video st strategy, how frequently are you publishing a video out there on, I, I think you said you're doing it on YouTube, right? So how, how often are you uh, publishing a video out there on YouTube? A few times, I'd say a few times a week on YouTube. Um, we're doing a new strategy that we actually launched a couple weeks ago. Um, it's been interesting. Uh, we're, uh, and I don't really have a name for it, but I'm kind of pulling back the curtain um, and it, we're kind of showing behind the scenes sort of stuff. And so I'll talk to a client. Um, I'll kind of look over. I've got a little tripod here. I'll kind of show it on camera. That's just sitting here and I'm just using my phone. Very simple. I've got more high-end cameras, but I'm just using my phone, shooting a quick two-minute video and then and then putting on the website. <clears throat> First day I did it, got three three new leads, took two of the, two new cases. It was very, very basic stuff. And it was like, you know, it's, it's relatable stuff. And, and a couple of them were about, uh, one of them was about a client being followed by an insurance company. It was a very simple one. Uh, another one was just dealing with, it was a stupid negotiation I had with an insurance company. How they're being ridiculous. Things like that, that people were like, oh yeah, they can't stay an insurance company. Like, they're sort of my boogeyman, you know? And so it, we'll call it the behind the scenes strategy. And it's been working really, really well. So we're, we're always kind of mixing things up. I try not to make my videos too polished because the open rates and the watch rates are not very long on those. And so I try to make them a little bit rough around the edges. Um, so yeah, so but I'd say now we're pushing that about three times a week on social media. Wow. So I, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this are like, holy crap, how am I going to put out three, <laughs> three videos a week? Um, you're just saying that I'm shooting it on my phone. I'm not, we're not making it professional looking and we're just posting it up there. So it goes on YouTube and uh, how do people find it? Like, are, are you putting ad dollars behind it or you, you have people who are searching for it and finding it that way? No ad dollars. So we're using something called TubeBuddy and you don't have to use this stuff. This is just extra tools that you can pay for to help you out. We use, we use TubeBuddy to help optimize it the best we can. Um, I, whenever, and I guess here's, I left this part out when we do the social media videos, I take the social media videos and I, and I've been doing sort of long form, uh, Facebook posts with a little column, you know, you, everyone hears about, you know, long for, form blog posts, long form emails. This is a long form uh, Facebook post and you write it like you would write an email. I put it on Facebook and it gets really, really, really good likes and comments. You get a lot of interaction. So a lot of engagement. I take that same content that I post on Facebook and I put that on my YouTube uh, YouTube posts. I don't I didn't used to do that. That's something new. We would uh, before we would put a nice little blurb about what what I talk about, put a nice title on it, you know, add my add my tags and pretty much be done. I'm adding that additional element to it, and it, we're we're two weeks in on that new this new uh, experiment. I don't know what I mean. The the numbers are still too early to tell. Hey, this is gonna be great or not it's working really, really good on Facebook. I don't know if it's going to be a great idea on YouTube. I don't, I'll, I'll do, I'll know in the next you know few months or so whether or not that's going to be a good, good way of doing it. Right. Yeah. But the fact that you put a video out and within, uh, with, you know, within days you're, you have multiple, um, you know, what you said clients, but even if you just have multiple inquiries, um, you know, then, then it's, it's, it's definitely working. And I mean, there are people who are listening to this that, would love to have three their phone ring three times <laughs> in a week. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You know? And uh, so definitely something that is worth trying and, and, and giving, giving a whirl, but also remember that Tyson started doing this when he had, you know, had a firm with four people in it. There's a time and place for everything. And if, if you're struggling to just be able to produce the work and put it out there, you know, perhaps a, a advanced strategy for bringing in clients is not where you should be focusing your effort. And instead you should be focusing on, on fixing the insides of your firm so that you can handle additional clients when they come in. 
Which brings us to another topic and that I think you're quite familiar with because you guys talk about it on the podcast all the time, and that is automation within the firm. And I know that, that this is something you're passionate about. So maybe they've got practice management software in place. They're trying to figure out how to uh, maybe automate some of the tasks that are going on behind the scenes and, and make sure things are not you know falling through the cracks. What are your top tips, I guess, for them on, on how to start tackling that elephant and making it easier for themselves. Okay. So to start two comments, one, if you have, if you think you have automation because you have doc gen on your, your case management system, that's not automation. Okay. We're talking about legit automation. Uh, so that's a quick comment. So just cause Clio has doc gen or all these other ones have doc gen. That is not, it's not automation. Okay. It's doc gen, something else. Um, so point number two, if you've not sat down and actually from A to Z said, okay, here's what the start of my case looks like. Here's what the end of my case looks like. If you've not done that, written it at A to Z, you need to start. That's where you, that's the starting point. That's what the starting point is. That's the starting point. So from the moment you pick up the phone call, what does your, what, what does your secretary say? You know, what sort of checklist do you have for what's a good case? What's not a good case? Uh, when do they pass that case on to you as opposed to them doing the initial intake? After you've done the intake, what's your intake process? What are the forms you, you need to use? What do you ask during the initial interview? You, so, I mean, from A to Z, what are the things you need to do? What are the forms you need to use from the moment you get the case to the moment you close that case? And then you're not done. How do you follow up with that person? So there, there's a lot to this. Is that a lot of work? Yeah, it is. It's absolutely a lot of work. But if you want to run a firm that's going to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger, or maybe you don't, maybe you just want to have a firm and be able to take a vacation for two weeks during the year, you need to systemize. You need to write everything out. So whenever you're gone, it's great. I remember whenever automation, I always knew I needed to automate stuff, but whenever it really hit me that it's fantastic. My biggest month I've ever had was a week that I was gone, right? I mean, it's like, think about that. I made the most money I've ever made in a week I was gone. I was out of the state. I was at a conference having, it was actually a fun conference I was at. So. Got to go away more often. Yeah, exactly right. That's what, that's what they kept joking with. They kept saying, you need to leave. Just ne never come back. I mean, it's just how it works sometimes, you know, you, and, and that's what, that's the power of automation. Things are happening without you having to, you know, actually do things on, you don't have to pull a document up and draft it. Things are going out automatically. So to, to answer your question though, go back sit down you know, after you get done with this podcast and just write out from A to Z. And even if it's just a basic one or two lines per, per section, segment out your firm from start to finish, and then write a couple things underneath it that need to be done under each, each one of those segments. It's a really, really helpful thing for you. Yeah. So I love that you say that because creating a process before implementing a system behind the process is, is absolutely key. Otherwise, uh, you know, people always put the software first, like, let me find the solution and then try to plug my, my practice and what we do right into that solution. And the reality is, is that they don't all fit and you end up, you end up trying to change your process in order to fit the solution that you put in place. And it's, it's not necessarily in your best interest to do that. So definitely documenting beforehand exactly what it is that you're doing and, and doing things manually with some sort of checklist and, and paper trail is definitely the, the first step. We all like to shortcut the process, but getting that all defined is, is the hard work. And once it's defined, getting the right system in place is definitely um, the easier part of that process. But a lot of the listeners here are, are using practice management software. Uh, many are using Clio and you mentioned DocGen with Clio. One of the things that Clio doesn't do well is task management, making sure that when you have a specific set of tasks in your process that need to get completed and being able to assign those tasks to somebody and knowing that one task can shouldn't be done until another one is completed so that they're relying on each other. Do you have any, any insight as to what people can use to start to make that process electronic rather than, it's not necessarily automation, it's really more uh, just making sure that everybody is being efficient and knows when it's their turn? Yeah, so, I mean, there's some basic things you, you can use. I mean, I kind of hate this topic, but I'm, I'm happy to answer it. It's, it's not 
it's not that I don't like the question. It's a very common question. It all has to do with personal preferences. Personally, I like Filevine. I think Filevine is an amazing case management system, but everyone's got a different opinion because there are so many case management systems out there. Clio is, is, is a fine product. I used to, the, my first, uh, after uh, starting my, own, my firm, I, we used to use needles at my old firm. When we started the new firm, we used Clio. I think Clio is a fine product. It's gotten a lot better than what it was before. There's a lot of advantages about it. It's a good product to use if you're a general practice because it does a variety of things. It's got time tracking, a lot of other things. It, it syncs up with Google Drive and Dropbox. There's a lot of great features about it. So my advice to you is when you're looking at a system like that, figure out what your processes are and then see if, they, if your processes fit within the, whatever the case management system is. Other tools that you might be able to use, Google Drive is great, Dropbox is great. Most people know about that stuff. Um, Zapier uh, is a really, really good product. It's, there's a free part of Zapier. I think you can get up to 20 zaps. Zapier allows you to connect different softwares and by I'm using the term softwares loosely because it connects email to Google Drive to probably even has a Clio Zap. I don't know, I'm quite sure. I'm not quite sure if it does. There's QuickBooks. Just go check out Zapier.com. It's an amazing product. That's that's a very simple one. Um, I don't know how detailed you want me to go. I, I use G Suite because it allows me to connect a lot of other softwares easily. Um, but hopefully that answers your question. I could I could go day, for days on different softwares that you could use. Right. No, you recently had a uh, podcast where you interviewed somebody uh, right after, I think it was the ABA tech conference. Um, and she was talking about Zapier and I think she's doing a session, your upcoming conference on that. Am I re remembering correctly? Yeah. So I honestly can't, t I can't remember <laughs> which, which person you're talking about. I remember a converse, conversation about it. We are going to have a panel just on automation and Zapier is going to be a big part of it. So yeah, you're right. Uh, but we're going to have about three or four people that are going to talk about that because Zapier is huge. I mean, and, and even the paid plans are super cheap. So it's a really, really effective tool. And I can't, cannot overstate that. It's a really good tool to use. And so if you're, I will also say though, it's probably a little too complicated for some people. If you're just starting out with some of this stuff, you may want to dip your toe in the water with other things before you get into Zapier because Zapier can be complicated in some, some aspects. Yeah. And I, I want to add here that not everybody is tech savvy. Um, so if this stuff scares you as an attorney and a firm owner, understand that you can have somebody on staff or an outside contractor do this stuff for you. So don't think that you need to figure everything out yourself. As a matter of fact, my position, and I wonder, Tyson, what you think about this. My position is, is that um, you as the firm owner should be doing as little as possible with everything in your firm, including the practice of law. You know, you, you should be figuring out every single piece of that comes across your desk. Who can I delegate this to? Who can handle this for me? Uh, do you have an opinion on that? I've got a strong opinion on it. I think you're absolutely right. I think you need to figure out what you want to do as the firm owner. If you just want to sit around and collect paychecks, guess what? You can figure that out. You're going to make less money in the long run, but and I guess not long run, you're going to make less money per paycheck because um, so, you're going to have to pay people to do it. You figure out what you want to do as a firm owner and you can do it. You can figure it out. Um, go through a little exercise and write down all the things, all the functions that you're doing on a daily basis and then figure out what you can automate, what you can delegate and what you eliminate. And that's really going to help you as a, to figure out how do you get to that point where you're doing only the things that you want to do and only the things that you should be doing. Um, so I think that's a really helpful way of doing it because I mean, you're right. I mean, it, let's be honest, you shouldn't be doing all the different things. For example, early on, I shouldn't have been answering the phone. I shouldn't have been scanning in documents. I shouldn't have been sending out letters. I mean, there's a variety of things I shouldn't have been doing. I was doing them when I started hiring and delegating people, uh, things to people. It, I made a lot more money. It just works that way. Um, and I started doing only the things I wanted to do. Right. And I know firsthand that even after you recognize that you need to hire somebody and you bring them on staff until you're, you're comfortable with saying, I don't have to be the one to do this and I can give it to somebody else. I can trust it will get done. And even if it's not done exactly the way that I want it, it's better than me own, keeping it, owning it and doing it myself. People will, will hire a paralegal and that paralegal will sit there all day idle waiting for work because they're not able to figure out how to delegate it. And 
and that's an art that needs to be learned uh, as you know if you haven't done it if you haven't been in a management position where you're delegating to other people at your previous you know employment at, a, at another law firm before you went out on your own that's something that you need to figure out how to do so that you're not keeping everything to yourself uh, and that goes for everything even beyond the the practice of law like you shouldn't be doing your own books. You should understand how to read them and how to see what's going on, but somebody else should be doing those books for you. And, you know, you shouldn't be implementing your own tech. Someone else should do it for you, but you should have a full understanding of what it's capable of doing and how to use it so that you can be an operator, but you don't need to be the one to figure everything everything out. So I want to ask you one more thing before we wrap up, and that is, People, when they're trying to grow their firm and they're, anybody trying to grow a business in general, at some point you're like, I can't do this on my own, right? I, I need help. Um, what's your take on where should people go to find support or rather than asking where they should go to find support, um, what was your experiences? Like, did you have mentors? Did you have coaches? Did you go to conferences? Like, where did you get the knowledge that you got? And I know that you're a weird breed because you knew from the beginning you wanted to start a firm and a lot of lawyers don't know that coming out of law school um, so you really came into this with an entrepreneurial mindset but uh, that aside even though you had the right mindset without making a ton of mistakes on your own you you had to have people you know guide you along the way so what was your journey and and what would you suggest to somebody who's on the same path as far as what kind of help they should look for um, get, a, get a mentor. I think that's a great way of doing it. I had a series of mentors. I didn't didn't just have one. Um, I, I took very seriously the, the adage, and I, I'm going to get it wrong, but it, basically you're the sum of the five people you hang out with the most. I don't know who said it, but it's it's really true. And so hang, hang out with high-level people. Hang out with the people that you envision yourself to be. I think that's a big part of it because you're going to, I mean, you, you could you just accidentally learn really great knowledge from them. So uh, I would start with that. A spinoff of that is masterminds. We did, we started with masterminds really early on. Me and Jim, actually, Jim Hacking, my co-host on Maximum Lawyer, we started our own little mini masterminds in St. Louis, and they were very effective. And we, what we did was we had made sure that we didn't bring in people that were in the same industry that was, as we were. At one point, I think we had three lawyers, but we had we were all in different practice areas. We are a group of eight people, and they 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 were different industries completely, and it was really mind blowing the things that we learned from other people. And it didn't cost us anything. It was just a group of eight people that would meet every six weeks. We would go out we'd have three people that would go in the hot seat each, each um, time we met. And it was, I mean, it was some pretty grueling times too, it, but it was, what you do is you start peeling back the layers. Cause when you're on a hot seat for 30 minutes and you basically you start with 10 minutes of talking about things you're doing. And then the rest of it is people just prying into you and just just prying and prying and prying you really get down to the deep stuff and you figure out what you need to do and what you need to change it's a really effective way um john fisher i've, I've been fortunate enough to i went to his mastermind five six years ago and i've become friends with him and he's a mentor now and i've i've become friends with a lot of high level people in that group i remember whenever i went to that group i looked around i'm gonna say i think i went to that group in 20 is maybe 2012 so it was about, oh geez, like seven years ago. Right. And I remember looking around seeing like, I, I shouldn't be in the room with this guy. I shouldn't be in the room with her. These are multi-million dollar lawyers and I'm learning from these people. You know, I mean, it's incredible. There's a lot of those opportunities around the country. So hit your wagon to some of these people um, and absorb as much as you can from them. And but make sure you don't mooch off them. Make sure you can give some value back to them too. So don't just, you know, hit your wagon and expect them to give you everything. Um, you're going to do, do a little work yourself too, but um, I, that's the main thing. And then I, I'm always learning. I mean, I'm, I'm reading two books right now. I, I, it was funny, 2018, I had to sort of slow down a little bit because 2017 by the, I think the fourth week I'd already went, read 22 books because I just kind of go through these binges where I just, I just read a lot of, a lot of it at, at one time. So 2018, I slowed down a little bit, but I think it's important that you're always sharpening your swords and always just learning, learning, learning. It's really important. Otherwise, you're not going to get better. Right. And the truth is that if you look at um, anybody who has achieved success in business, um, at, you know, they, they're always they're always consuming. They're always asking questions. If you go to a conference, you'll find those people in the front of the room. You know, they're they're, they're not afraid to learn from others, even though 
they might be a guru or you know in in a leadership role um, front and center. They're constantly trying to improve themselves, and and I think that's a good point. And the fact that you're listening to this podcast and listening to this in- interview uh, means that you're in the right place. Like you're already trying to find out that information. You're consuming it. And Tyson and and Jim have uh, a great podcast themselves. And this is a great segue here to to jump into that real quick. So Tyson, just tell us a bit about that podcast. And then I'm curious to know, as you're sharing, I'm curious to know how you and Jim um, hooked up. You guys are co-hosts on that podcast. Like, how did you get introduced to each other and, you know, and end up starting this show together? It's, it's funny. So Jim and I had a, um, we had a conversation a few weeks ago, just kind of like, jogging it jogged my memory like how it all kind of started because Jim and I knew each other because he was an adjunct professor at St. Louis University uh, School of Law and he taught a law practice management case, uh, class and it, it was really kind of cool because he taught it the way he taught it was he brought in people other lawyers and he, I mean he taught like a couple of classes but otherwise it was a two-hour class he would bring in a person to, to speak the first hour and then we would learn the second half it was actually really kind of a cool class and there's probably three people that really cared about that class it was a summer class but I was one of the people that really I loved it I kind of soaked it up I but again that's also I knew what I wanted to do and I think that's one of the values of knowing where you're headed Um, because if you're sort of flopping in the wind you don't quite have that that guidance you know I had that guidance because I I knew where I wanted to go we just sort of stayed in touch but it was funny because we had actually by chance we I wouldn't say we drifted away. We hadn't, we were still t- staying in touch every few months. We actually ran into each other at a Culver's and it was like in a random spot in St. Louis. Uh, I just happened to pull in. I wasn't, I hadn't even had any, didn't even have any plans to pull in there. And I just happened to, cause I was hungry. Same thing for him. We sat down and talked about an hour and then we just kind of re-engaged and started talking again. And then we started talking about marketing every week or so. And then we said, you know, let's just start recording this. And it just seriously just started with a couple of guys with a with a couple of microphones we didn't know what the heck we were doing i can say i can already tell you, you've already done a lot more research on getting this thing going than we did we didn't know what tools we were supposed to use we we probably recorded five episodes that did that have never aired because we didn't record it i mean there, there's so many errors that you make but i'd say about the 10th episode we said hey let's do a facebook group face group groups people started to engage there and that's really been the rocket fuel to get the, the the podcast going. It's taken off from there. We've had some of the best attorneys in the country, some of the best lawyer business owners in the country on the podcast, um, best, some of the best experts in the country on on variety of things, marketing, practice management, whatever it may be. Um, and it's really taken off. We've last year we had a conference, and I think we had a, we had about four four uh, months of runway. We said, hey, let's do a conference. And so we we had never done a, a conference in our lives. And 75 people showed up and we're like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. You know, people actually showed up to this. A guy from Canada showed up. This is insane. And then this year we're going to get, we're going to hit 150 with that problem. And we've got sponsors now. It's, it's been insane. It's, it's been a fun journey, but it really just started with two guys and a microphone. That's it. That's so interesting. And what, what's interesting is, is that you didn't really have any intention of where it was going to go. It was just kind of like, Hey, let's, let's do this and, and put this out there. What was your motivation? Just adding value to others is, you know, is that, is that just what it is? Like what's the why behind, the, behind yeah, so, that? Launch? So we had, it's funny. We still haven't even figured out necessarily how we're going to monetize it. Um, we, we had talked about early on, okay, is this something we can, you make some money off of, but that was, that was a secondary thing. We did really just like, let's share, let's share what information we have. I mean, we feel like we know a little bit, you know, so let's share what information we have. Let's sort of spread the love. And that's how it's always been. I sort of call it a, call it a crowdsourced podcast because we have so many people that just contribute and to right. help, help make it better. Um, I mean, honestly, we don't make any money off of it. So it's still just that same thing. We're just sharing knowledge um, and it's other people's knowledge that, that we're mostly sharing. We still share some of our own knowledge, but it's mostly people that come on and learn from, from our guests. Uh, I, I, we've got some ideas. We actually met a couple of weeks ago. We've got an idea in the works on how a couple of things we're going to be able to help spread the love, contribute for more high level law firm owners, people that are, that want to get to that million dollar mark. So we, we do have got some ideas in the works, but we, we we're very, very uh, cautious about altering what we have because the podcast is such a, awesome community. It really is such a group of people that really just, you go to the Facebook group and people just 
giving their biggest secrets away. And, you know, it's, 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 and everyone's sharing, you know, there's no takers. We kick takers out of the group. So if you come in and start advertising, we kick you out of the group right away. Right. So there's, it is, we're very, very, uh, we, we're, we shelter the group as, as much as we can. And so we, we don't want to ever, people are like, well, you should advertise. We don't take advertisers because we don't want to affect what we normally, what we have and how group, how good that group is and how good the podcast is now. So um, I'm just sort of rambling now, but right. No, that, it's that your question though. Hopefully. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, and it's great because, um, it, it, really the shows that, that, that people are attracted to and that they want to listen to are the ones that are there just for the greater good and to serve, serve the community. I mean, I, even me, um, as a, as a, a law firm growth coach, I'm not, I can't come to it with this complete 100% giving. I'm just doing it for the sake of everybody because everyone knows that, ultimately I, I want more business like you know and although that's not that's really not my motivation it really is just let me get this information out there and help as many people as i want because there's no way that i'm going to serve everybody that's out there and there's also no way that the free stuff that they're hearing on the podcast is going to be the perfect solution for everybody there's always a, something more that somebody needs but i love that you guys are approaching it this way and you won't even take advertisers for that reason and, uh, you know, we can chat offline on some ideas of, uh, of what you can do to, to monetize the podcast, but I know that's not your motivation and it's really cool. But you did mention this conference last year, you had 75 people this year, you're gonna have 150 people. Who's that conference for? And, um, and, and how many spots you have open and what does it cost to attend and, and how do they go and sign up? We are, th we have less than 40 spots left. So we've sold the majority of our tickets and we're still, I mean, we're, we haven't, I mean, we're in March still. So um, I don't know if this is coming out in March, but we're, we're in March now. And the conference is June 5th, 6th, and 7th. To get tickets, you go to maximumlawyer.com. You can um, get them there. You can also search us on Eventbrite if you want to join the Facebook group. Um, you can get involved there. The only requirements are that you're a lawyer and you don't advertise. That's it. So, um, uh, that that's about it so you can get in the group it's free you can get all the free knowledge from people and there's ways of, of there's links to the conference there uh you know what we do so last year was really interesting so what we with the podcast what we what we do is we have people on to talk about their knowledge and share their knowledge and sometimes it's just law firm owners that, that know something very specific about a certain thing we have them come on we took a very similar approach last year with the conference where you know we would have a speaker come on talk about a topic that they know about and they could have some of them were big names and some of them were small names but they knew something really really well and they came in and talked about it. we're going to do the same thing this year um but it's funny last year we had 45 minute speaking spots and we thought that those were really short but we've learned and we're actually doing 20 minute speaking spots so we're really cutting it down it's it's sort of ted style but when, when people come in they're talking, they're laser focused and they're talking about a specific topic. And so we're going to have double the speakers this year, but a lot more content. It's going to be laser focused. And so same thing, you know, it, it's a variety of things. It's intake, it's practice management, it's systemizing things, it's marketing, you know, video, Google AdWords, a variety of things. We've got some of the, I'll say some of the most knowledgeable speak, people in the country coming to talk. It's, it's going to be amazing. Yeah, it sounds amazing, and it sounds like uh, you'd be you'd you'd be a fool not to not to attend this conference. So, if you're available, was it June fifth, sixth, and seventh? Did I get that right? Yeah. So, and I mean, let me look at my calendar just to make sure I keep because we we have a it's a free half day, um, which is it's a dinner basically. Um, yeah. So fifth is a Wednesday, so you come in, we have a free dinner with drinks, and then sixth and seventh are full days, Thursday, Friday. And so, and with those on Thursday night, there's another dinner and we have well, the entertainment. It's, it's a basically start to finish kind of thing. And last year we did a Cardinals game and we got rid of the Cardinals game this year because we wanted to make sure everyone can attend. So we're having a live concert and all that kind of stuff. It's going to be, I think it's going to be pretty bananas. I think it's going to be awesome. That's awesome. So again, they can uh, find out the, the link for it in the Facebook group, right? They got to go and join the Facebook group. What's the name of the group? That's Maximum Lawyer. I think it's just Maximum Lawyer Podcast is the name of the group. You can also go to MaximumLawyer.com and you can get, there's a link there as well. 
That's great. All right, so go check it out. Um, we'll also link that up in the show notes, and hopefully you can join Tyson. And is Jim going to be there? I'm assuming Jim will be there right? too. Yeah, all the Tyson care. and Jim and and, uh, and 150 other attorneys, uh, as well as all the speakers. And uh, it sounds like a, a wonderful, wonderful time and a wonderful opportunity. Tyson, I thank you so much for your time and your knowledge and sharing here on the podcast. And guys, go check out the Maximum Lawyer podcast. It's an awesome show. And Tyson and Jim do a great job. They bring on great guests and I'm enjoying it myself. So uh, you know that you will too. So Tyson, thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Appreciate it. That's it for this week's episode of Profit With Law. If you have enjoyed the show, please consider sharing it with at least one person. Imagine how many lives we can change if we each shared this episode. Another way to share the episode is on social media. We appreciate your support and look forward to you joining us again next week.